Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel Network Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. Wisdom is understanding God's Word. Pastor Murray's unique teaching approach brings God's Word alive with meaning as he takes you on a chapter-by-chapter, verse-by-verse study of God's letter to you, the Bible. Here is Pastor Arnold Murray. Good day to you. God bless you. Say welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this family Bible study hour. Probably one of my most favorite chapters in God's Word. I know you've heard me say that many times. But Matthew 24 is, it's, it's fantastic. Why? Well, probably the most asked question of Christians, when, when is Christ returning? And the disciples ask him, and in this 24th chapter, he tells them. He gives them seven events that shall transpire that consummate the end of this age. They're the exact equivalent of the seven trumpets. So it really doesn't leave too much covered that isn't uncovered if you just let his word flow and keep man's traditions off to the side. Thus far, as we're going to pick this up in the 25th verse, he has said the main thing you want to be careful of is people that come in his name claiming to be Christ's disciples or teachers or preachers or reverends, indicating there's a lot of them out there and a lot of them I didn't send because they're going to be teaching a different way than I say the end is going to be. That's why it's important that you would hear. He said that there would be wars and rumors of wars. What's the opposite? Peace, peace, peace. You hear a lot of that today. That is the opposite. You still have skirmishes, but you still hear that great cry of peace, peace, peace. And he said for his sake, meaning for uh, God's word, his purpose, that some of you would have a destiny, that you would be delivered up before a spurious messiah. And he didn't say maybe the spurious Messiah would come. He said he would come. And he called it the first tribulation. You see, there are two tribulations. We don't have to worry about either one of them. Why? Well, number one, we have power over Satan. And he is the person that will bring about the first tribulation among Christianity claiming to be Christ. That's, that's no problem. It, we, as it is written in another place, escape the hour of temptation. Why? We do not find Satan tempting. Quite the reverse. We find him an abomination. So you escape that by knowing what? By having the seal of God in your forehead, which is to say his truth. So it's important. That you, and he, he mentions, woe to you that are with child when I return in the 19th verse. Meaning, I want a virgin bride spiritually when I return. And he said, especially woe to you that are giving suck. Meaning, you've been unfaithful and you're even nursing a small child when your husband-to-be has been away for 2,000 years. Speaking in a spiritual sense, of course. Indicating what? that there's going to be a lot of people deceived that are not familiar with God's Word, have listened to traditions and the way they say the end's going to be, rather than the simplicity in Christ's teachings. Hey, the choice is yours. It really is. Because you're the one that's going to have to live with it for an eternity. So, if I were you, I believe I would rather choose the Lord's Word, not what this man or any other man might say but what he actually taught, how he declared these seven things, which are the seven seals, the seven trumps. So there should be no great mystery when you hear them. And he had just stated that for the elect's sake, he had shortened the time. We know from Revelation chapter 9, it was shortened to a five-month period, the so-called uh, seven-year period. And then he declared that 
the spurious Messiah would come. If they tell you he's out in the desert or somewhere else, don't believe it. Quite frankly, as long as you're in a flesh body, the true Christ has not returned. And a real easy rule of thumb, until the seventh trump sounds, I don't care what any man, spirit, our tradition might say to you, Christ will not return until the seventh trump. That's the last one, meaning at the completion of these seven events that consummate the end of this age. With that having been said, let's pick it up, if we may, with verse 25. He had stated those things I forementioned. We ask a word of wisdom from our Father in Yeshua's name. Verse 25, Matthew 24. Let's go with it. It reads, Behold, I have told you before. I've told you all this before, and he had in his teachings. 26, wherefore, if they say unto you, behold, he is in the desert, go not forth. Behold, he is in the secret chambers, believe it not. What does that mean? It means if someone tells you, that Christ has returned and you have not seen the true Christians delivered up before him with the Holy Spirit speaking through them with that tongue that was spoken by those that gathered on Pentecost Day, as Peter would say, this is that that was spoken by Joel the prophet, talking about the army, the locust army of Satan's and what the sons and daughters would be saying in a tongue that would be understood in every language around the world. Not an unknown tongue. But the evidence of the Holy Spirit is that every entity would understand it clearly in their own dialect. So, what he's saying is, don't believe that the true Christ has returned when you hear these first mutterings. Verse 27, For as the lightning cometh out of the east, and shineth even unto the west, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. In other words, as sure as the sun comes up in the east and goes down in the west. Number one, we know that his feet land on the Mount of Olives, which is east of, this, uh, of the temple, or Judea, as it is written in this chapter, all right, in uh, verse... Um, in verse... Um, 16. So, it means as sure you can count on it. The true son shall return. And then he gives you some clues. Listen carefully. Verse 28. For wheresoever the corcus is, what's a corcus? That's something dead. All right. Wheresoever the corcus is, there will the eagles be gathered together. Many, um, many translate this as uh, vultures. Naturally, Jerusalem is the subject, geographically speaking. So you don't have to sweat that. That's real easy to figure. But the corcus also is the dead one. What does perdition mean? He that's going to perish or die. Or as Christ would say in Hebrews chapter 2 verse 14, I came to this earth to die on the cross, whereby in turn I could destroy death, which is to say the devil. He is Mr. Death. He is the corcus. He is the one that's going to perish. That's why when the son of perdition is mentioned, it can only fit one entity, and that is Satan. Now, I think it's important, though, that we call up this word eagles in the Greek so that you can have a better look at it. Now, now sharpen up for me. Really think. The word in your Greek dictionary of your Strong's Concordance is the word 105. And it will sound partially familiar, you that have studied with me, aetos, a, a as in... It's uh, from the same as 109. That should mean a lot to you. It's the prime. An eagle from its wing-like flight. It's important that you catch the word flight. Now I want the prime, if we may, 109. The word is the same word used in 2 Thessalonians where you to meet Christ in the air. The word in the Greek is air which is to say it is from, it is to breathe unconsciously. 
uh, to respire uh, by analogy to to blow air as naturally that it is circumvented and it's it, it's the breath of life all right you're not going together to the true Christ until you meet him in this breath of life body which is to say that you won't be in the flesh I find it fascinating that this word is utilized here by Christ that and what he's saying in a sense you can rest assured that Christ um, as sure as the Sun comes up in the morning that when he does return you're going to find some of them gathered around the corcus which is to say Satan thinking he is Messiah but they're not going they're only going to be in an imitation flight body all right F shaped as flight deceived into believing they're going to fly I can't help but thinking at the same time of Ezekiel chapter 13 verse 20 if we may let's have that on the screen at the same time and it reads uh, in Ezekiel 13 20 wherefore thus saith the Lord God now who's speaking the Lord God I am against your pillows wherewith ye there hunt the souls to make them fly and I will tear them from your arms and you will let the souls go even the souls that you hunt to make them fly you're gonna rapture out God hates that he's against it and yet people continue to teach it he warned in that 13th chapter of Ezekiel so here you have the word era there's nothing about atmosphere in that Greek word where we meet him we meet him in the spiritual body when he returns when at the last trump we're instantly as Paul would reiterate in 1st Corinthians chapter 15 verse 52 changed instantly into that breath of life body which is simply to say our spiritual body the reason I went into that Christ gave us a little hidden truth there for those that have eyes to see and ears to hear it's too bad that more people do not study their father's word in more depth then they would not have to worry about the deceivers uh, I know that may offend some be that as it may if the shoe fits put it on and wear it verse 29 immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the Sun be darkened it's important that you note it didn't say 30 years later it said immediately after the first tribulation the Sun will be darkened this is how you can tell when the true Christ returns and the moon shall not give her light and the stars shall fall from heaven and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken meaning starting at a five month period before this it's shaken and Satan and his angels are cast out as it is written in Revelation chapter 12 verse 7 and in that short period there will be many that will be deceived don't miss chapter 25 concerning the ten virgins five of them won't be virgins when he returns and they were good Christian people it's just they hadn't studied God's Word they had listened to traditions of flying when God is against it as you read for yourself in Ezekiel chapter 13 verse 20 the pillows are the he says in the Hebrew manuscripts that you sew scarfs and put them over my outreach saving arms that people can't see the real truth with your flyaway doctrine that's what he was talking about in Ezekiel 13, uh, 13 verse 30 this is how the true Christ appears some would tell you well this this is the second advent he's already made his little short trip not so don't go for that deception this is his return he said don't let him fool you it's not going to happen until after those events the deception takes place but immediately after that what verse 30 then and then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven 
And then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and glory. Do you know why there's going to be a whole lot of mourning going on? Because a lot of them will be spiritually deceived and have accepted that spurious Messiah. He's in the desert and they're going to go. You know, people in the flesh that are biblically illiterate today will worship, a lot of, a lot of people would worship some musician. Go nuts over them. And wait till you see this boy, the spurious Messiah. Verse 31. And he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet. Here's your seventh trump. And they shall gather together his elect from the four winds, from one end of the heaven to the other. There is a great uh, prophecy within the very four winds that he speaks of here. And it's ironic that it's mentioned both in Revelation chapter 7 and Daniel chapter 7 concerning the four winds that hold the end of time or cause it to come to pass. And he gives them, our Father gives them the moment and the hour. But it began, that's a different study for a different time, okay? But um, you might, I think I have a tape titled The Four Winds. If you're not familiar with it, you'd better get it. It's very important concerning the close of this age. Verse 32. Now learn a parable of the fig tree. Now, did it say, maybe you should get around to this? Maybe you should think about it? He said, learn it. That's an order. That's a command. Learn a parable of the fig tree. When his branch is yet tender and putteth forth leaves, ye know that summer is nigh. What is he talking about here? It's a different, this again is a different subject. If you need help with, with studying, there's a tape also, a lecture on the parable of the fig tree. And you've got to learn it. You've got to know it. Otherwise, you would not understand uh, the, uh, our brother Judah, along with, as it is written in Jeremiah chapter 24, the bad figs, both the good and the bad figs, returning to Jerusalem in the year of our Lord, 1948, which is the generation of the fig tree. And it's paramount. You must know that and have it seared, branded into your mind of truth to understand the chronological order of events that do consummate the end of this age as they are set forth not by man, but by the word of God. Do you not remember when Jesus would walk, have walked uh, recently as we were studying by the fig tree and cursed it? And it withered instantly. And then would tell you if you had the faith of a mustard seed that you would be able to move that mountain or nation into the sea. What with? Truth. So you don't have to take too serious the first tribulation because you're a child of God and you have power over Satan and no Christian should fear Satan or any evil spirit. Take the authority that God has given you and use it. When you see that uh, parable of the fig tree, when his branch is yet tender and putteth forth leaves, you know that summer is nigh. Meaning what? What happens in the summer? Harvest. He said earlier in this chapter, pray that your flight be not in the winter. Why? That's not the harvest time, and it means you'd be harvested out of season by the Spirit's Messiah. The horticulture concerning the fig is that you set out a shoot. You didn't say when you see the fruit. Why? It's not going to produce any fruit. When you see the leaves grow, know that summer is nigh, meaning that Christ's return is very soon. Verse 33, so likewise ye, 
when you shall see all these things, know that it is near even at the door. That is to say, he is, Christ is. He's in our hearts, he's in our mind, he's in us in the spiritual sense because we are in him and he is in us. But de facto, he's returning. 34, verily I say unto you, he's saying here, I want to bear down on this, so truly, or you can count on it, I say this to you, this generation shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled. What things? The events he has shared with us and the ones he's about to. You're going to see it come to pass. Nobody's going anywhere until it does. If you believe Christ, the only thing you will escape in the first tribulation is the temptation. You won't find Satan tempting because you're literate in God's word rather than biblically illiterate as many are, and you're not going to be deceived. 35, heaven and earth shall pass away. That's to say this heaven age and this earth age, they're going to pass away. But my words shall not pass away. In other words, you can count on it. It's going to come to pass exactly as it's written. God's word will be the same in the millennium and the eternity as it is today. That's why you never waste time studying it because it's going to be with us always. Verse 36, but of that day and hour knoweth no man. This means the instant. No man knows the instant. No, not the angels of heaven, but my father only. Now there is one thing. You know that when these events start coming to pass that you're in the season. You know that when, example, when the two witnesses die in the streets of Jerusalem in about three days, the true Christ is returning. So the knowledge of the word gives us the strength and the faith and the surety, the guarantee that we're really in control. Satan, as the spurious Messiah, will just think that he is. But we're in control. Why? Because we're not to premeditate. It's God himself working through us, through the Holy Spirit, and only God is in control. Another clue. How sharp are you? Listen to it. But as the days of Noe were, that's to say Noah in the Hebrew, so shall also be the coming of the Son of Man, as uh, shall the Son of Man be. Well, how was it in the days of Noah? Well, I don't know. Let's, let's see what he says here, 38. For as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah, Noah entered into the ark. Giving in marriage to who? Who were they giving in marriage? Who were they taking in marriage? Well, that's real easy to, to find out. Go back with me to Genesis chapter 6. And uh, if you believe the Word of God, it's not difficult to understand. And I want you to, I want you to pick it up, if you would, at verse 2. In verse 2 of Genesis 6 reads... This is right before, this is right before the ark is being built. This is right before the flood. Adam and his, uh, the uh, uh, sons and daughters were beginning to multiply. Beautiful women. But what happened? The fallen angels saw them, or the angels saw them, and part of them fell. In the Hebrew tongue, Nephilim. Verse 2. That the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were fair. I mean, they, they were beautiful. And they took them wives of all which they chose. Never forget that we human beings are made in the image of God and the angels. So naturally, as long as Adam was made that way, they were male in this earth age. I say again, in the body, angelic body of this earth age. Verse 3. 
And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he also is flesh. Yet his days shall be an hundred and twenty years. In other words, God made man carnal flesh for a program to test whether you're going to love him or Satan. Four, there were giants in the earth in those days. Why? Because of the cross-breeding with Nephilim and women. They were called Geba, these sons of God. And there were giants, misfits, six fingers, six toes, huge monstrosities. And also after that, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, and they bear children to them. I wanted to read that so you would ha have no doubt what we're talking about. They took wives. What happens when you take a wife and cohabit with them? Children, that's the offspring. They were able, inasmuch as it is written in the book of Psalms, that we, as our ancestors, wandered in the wilderness 40 years, they partook of angels' food, which is manna, which sustains both the angelic body and the human body. I mean, that's common sense. Face it. Bear children to them. The same became mighty men, which were of old men of renown. Meaning, they knew what had happened before. That is to say, in the first earth age. I know I'm going to lose some of you through parts of this. If you're a new listener, basically, place it on the shelf and let it sit there, sit there for a while and think on our Father's word. Does the New Testament ever mention such a thing? Well, of course it does. And Paul himself would be teaching uh, to the Corinthians. And he would, uh, most uh, so-called ministers teach this as a woman's hair. It has nothing to do with a woman's hair. It's a veil over the head, which means she should have Christ over her head. Why? To protect her from what? Revelation 12, 8. God is casting out through Michael, Satan and his little fallen angels again. Do you know what they like to do? Well, you just read it. And Paul is saying, keep Christ on your head, which means we have power. A woman has power over Satan or any of his little ones as long as she keeps Christ there. Paul would teach this, and I'm not going to belabor it. I'm only going to read the 10th verse of 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Listen to it, the subject that I just mentioned. For this cause ought the woman to have power on her head because of the angels. What angels? The fallen angels that are going to be cast out on this generation. So, what did Christ say? They're going to be doing it again, giving and taking in marriage. That's the way it's going to be at the end. It's going to be as it was in the beginning. Let's return to Matthew 24, verse 39. Uh, it's going to be just like it was in the days of Noah, okay? And, knew, and before they entered the ark, up to that day, and knew not until the flood came and took them all away, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. So, you want to be in the ark of the end times, and that is in God's truth, so that you're not deceived, so that you're not swallowed up in the great miracles that these supernatural entities will be performing in the sight of men on earth claiming to be children of God, which in fact they are, but they're fallen. Bad example, friend, to follow the fallen that are out of the way and the will of God, which is very easy to ascertain simply by understanding the word of God. Verse 14. Then shall two be in the field. The one shall be taken and the other left. Now, my friends, what is our subject? Our subject is silly people being deceived by the spurious one. How many times have you heard some preacher say, 
Oh, I pray I'm one taken from the field. Well, fool, and, and I'm not saying uh, the Hebrew word um, um, which means fool, which is maranis, which is to say uh, somebody that, uh, that cares nothing whatsoever about God nor ever will. I'm saying a man is a fool that will teach that because the subject is being taken by the false Christ. You better stay in the field doing God's work and let the fool go because they're going to hop in bed with the spurious Messiah and his fallen angels. Big party time, big wedding. You want to have a part in it? Then don't pray that you'll be the first one taken because they're on a quick trip to hell, all right? God says, occupy till I come. That means the true Christ, not the fake. 41, two women shall be grinding at the mill, and one shall be taken and the other left. And again, you've heard many a preacher say, oh, just pray that you're the one taken. Well, who would want to pray for a quick trip to hell or deception? What is grinding? Grinding flour. What does flour make? It makes bread. You had better stay in the manna of God and receive the stone, white stone with a new name written, which means the seal of God in your forehead, as it is stipulated in Revelation chapter 2, doing God's work instead of whoring around after the spurious Messiah to cause yourself to be with spiritual child and nursing along his work. Oh yes, let's have a revival tonight and call all out to worship Messiah. Stay in the word of God and keep doing his work and see that no man deceives you for there are many deceivers entered into the world. You'll find that written back in the, it's not my words. Verses 4 and 5 of this same chapter, written again in the, in the 13th chapter of Mark. I don't know. Do you enjoy doing God's work or do you not enjoy doing God's work? It's up to you. Do you want to do Satan's work? Then hop out of the field and hop into his little uh, church. He's anxious for it. He'd love it. Verse 42, watch therefore... Listen, if you're a watchman, you'd better listen. Watch therefore, for you know not what hour your Lord doth come. What hour is it talking about? As I stipulated, you do know the season. You do know the season. And you'd better be aware of it. Verse 43. But know this, that if the good man of the house had known in what watch the thief would come, he would have watched and would not have suffered his house to be broken up. You know, he would be prepared. He'd have a 12-gauge a shotgun loaded with double-aught buckshot, and he would have fixed, he would have loaded his britches, all right? No problem. He would have been prepared. And if you are familiar with God's Word, you will be prepared spiritually. 44. Therefore be ye also ready, for in such an hour as you think not, the Son of Man cometh. Do you mean to tell you what hour it is? It's real simple, and we'll pick it up um, in the next lecture. You'll find it in Revelation chapter 17. And you find that hour described in the 12th verse of that chapter when it talks about the great harlot, that's to say the Christians riding the back of the false Messiah in the one world system with ten rulers, all right? Now, 1712, book of Revelation, and the ten horns which thou sawest are ten kings. That's earthly men. That means a political dynasty on earth, which have received no kingdom as yet, and they're not about to until the spurious Messiah appears, but receive power as kings one hour with the beast. And of course, Revelation chapter 9 makes it very clear that that one hour period is a five month period. That is the five months in which the events that we've been studying in this 24th chapter of Matthew transpire. How are you going to be fixed, friend? If you have faith, you don't have anything to be frightened of. 
you don't have anything to worry about because if you have faith, you know our Father is able. He only allows the spurious Messiah to do this to check out the minds of the so-called Christians, people of the world, whether they're biblically illiterate or not, whether they've listened to man, many times guided by Satan, not knowingly, or do they think they're guided by Satan, but they go contrary to the Word of God, which should wise them up. In other words, when you hear a so-called preacher, Reverend, uh, Doctor of Divinity, divine people, saying they want to be the first one taken, that's about 180 degrees off. And my friend, you can't get any further off than that. Then wake up. Something is wrong. Let God's word speak for itself. Don't listen to this man or any other man. Check the word out for yourself. For as it is written, so shall it come to pass. You can count on it. Verily, truly, it shall come to pass as it's written. As it was in the beginning, so it shall be at the end. I don't know. How are you fixed, friend? Think about it. Don't miss the next lecture. All right. Bless your hearts. Listen a moment, won't you please?